We are Embrace the Suck 21. Yes, we are. I'm Spencer. And I'm Daniel. And we're doing a little learning today. We are checking out, for the second time on this channel, Alan Turing. This is the documentary, The Scientist Who Saved the Allies, Man Who Cracked the Nazi Code. Now, this is going to be interesting because I feel like the first time he was on the channel was more of like Cliff Notes version. Like they got like a 10 minute video, right? Right, like an infographics kind of thing. Yeah. I could be 100% wrong on what it was, but it was very short and condensed. And this one's a longer one. We can dive a little deeper into it. I'm down it. with that. Hell yeah, man. Yeah. This was picked from our Patreon supporters. Every other week we do a poll in Patreon asking what long documentary they want us to do. So if you want to be a part of that, link in the description for that. What? You ready to go in? Oh yeah, man. Let's do it. Let's learn. All right. Three, two, one. June the 6th, 1944. One of the major turning points in contemporary history. In one day, 156,000 men and 20,000 vehicles landed on the coasts of Normandy. They would change the course of the war and begin the final assault against the Nazis. But in order for the picture to really be complete, you would have to add to this immense armada a brain. And not just any brain. A brain brimming with abstract speculations and imaginary machines in which you'd search in vain to find any strategic or military ideas. Hmm. The owner of this brain was called Alan Turing. And his is a strange story, a paradox. He was neither a general nor a strategist, but rather a mathematician. Mm. His domain was a very abstract branch of mathematics, logic. And yet, according to some historians, his ideas allowed us to shorten the war by two years. Wow. How could a person concerned with such abstract things have impacted history so? And how is it that such exploits were so poorly rewarded? Uh-oh. Convicted as a homosexual, Turing was subjected to chemical castration and died at age 43, under oh, conditions wow. that have yet to be elucidated. Jack Copeland has dedicated much of his career to this extraordinary person. Turing contributed to a remarkable number of diverse fields during his life. Um, he was mathematical logician, turned code breaker, turned computer pioneer, turned artificial intelligence pioneer, turned mathematical biologist. There are very few other uh, scientists in the 20th century who match the span of Turing's work. It is all united by one overarching theme. He was interested in what can be done by mechanical means. Hmm. So when he was studying mathematical logic, he was really studying machines. Wow. So right out the gate, I predict that we're going to learn that this was a dude way ahead of his time. Oh, like, yeah. Up oh. there with, yeah, up there with Nikola Tesla uh, in terms of like forward thinking, like Leonardo da Vinci of his time. Um, people like the Thomas Edisons and the Albert Einsteins could only wish to be as good as Mr. Alan Turing or Sir Alan Turing. I don't know. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm here for it. I mean, it's interesting. I feel like in order to sometimes be able to see past what's in front of you, you have to be thinking differently like you have yeah. to be built and wired different yeah and mm. i i wish i could think in mathematical form formulations like i hated math in in oh, yeah. school it was just was my one of my weakest subjects of all time yeah me too me too yeah. <laughs> i hated it, that it, I hated it if it Anything other than addition, subtraction, division, and multiplication. Like, if I didn't need it to make change in a fast food restaurant or a, a retail store, it was just not necessary yeah. for me, yep. at least. Yeah, very true. I'm, I'm exactly the same way, dude. Yeah. The strange machines imagined or inspired by Alan Turing are the basis for all computers today. Huh and they played a capital role in the victory against Nazism. How then can this story be told? Let's begin it with a beach. A beach on the Atlantic coast where, without Alan Turing, 
nothing might have happened on the morning of June the 6th, 1944. Sous le commandement du général Eisenhower, les forces navales alliées, avec le soutien des puissantes formations aériennes, ont commencé ce matin le débarquement des armées alliées sur les côtes nord de la France. Due to the quantity of naval, land and air forces deployed, D-Day was the greatest combined action of all time. But before launching the troops and materials for the assault on the coast of Normandy, they had to be brought across an ocean, and thus the North Atlantic supply routes had to be kept opened. It was from Liverpool that the Allied command led the Battle of the Atlantic against the Kriegsmarine and particularly the U-boats, the formidable German submarines. This is the headquarters of Commander-in-Chief Western Approaches in Derby House in Liverpool. It is here where the Battle of the Atlantic was fought on a daily and nightly basis from 1941 until the end of the Battle of the Atlantic in May 1945. The battlefield was the North Atlantic, 50 million square kilometers. The stakes were to keep the shipping routes open, to allow merchant ships to cross despite the German subs. People have concentrated on the 6th of June, and indeed it was a considerable achievement landing approximately 100,000 troops on one day in 1944. But to give you some idea, by the end of that month, by the end of June 1944, there were a million troops on the ground in wow. Northwest Europe. In addition to that, all these troops had to carry with them sufficient ammunition, fuel, food, and all these things, all these supportive things, have all got to be in position in Britain, broadly speaking, by the beginning of June 1944. And that is where the Battle of the Atlantic comes in, where the only way that almost everything can come is by sea. The other indispensable condition for D-Day to be a success was disinformation. With Operation Fortitude, the Allies would launch a vast campaign designed to pass off the operation in Normandy as a simple diversion before the real landing more to the east in the Pas de Calais. Ah. But in order to win these two battles, the Atlantic and the disinformation, a third would have to be won first. A more abstract war, the bulk of which would be played out in a small town north of London called Bletchley. Another war was fought here, far from the battlefields, a war whose goal was to break the German and Japanese codes. In this old-fashioned Victorian mansion and these hastily constructed huts, a veritable decrypting industry would see the day, one which would employ as many as 9,000 people wow. by the end of the war. Wow. Bletchley Park was the scene of the most incredible code-breaking operation in the whole of human history. It was the first time and possibly the last time that one side had virtually open access to the coded military communications of the other side. Here at Bletchley Park, the amount of detail that they achieved and the phenomenal quantity of information that they managed to extract from Germany's coded communications, coded radio communications, is absolutely staggering. Today, Bletchley Park has become a museum dedicated to the Code War, to its machines and to its heroes. You can see the traces of Alan Turing everywhere. From his old office, to his stuffed bear, Aww. and also his statue. But in order to understand the central role he played in this enterprise, you must first take an interest in his ideas. Ideas which in the mid-1930s were several decades ahead of the rest of the world. Yeah. 
here we are in Cambridge, one of England's major university towns. This is where Turing studied, huh. right here at King's College. At the start of the 30s, Turing was just a student here. He was shy, a bit awkward, doubtlessly intimidated by this temple of British education and distinction, whose decor and traditions haven't changed in centuries. More at ease with numbers than with his contemporaries, he observed the world around him with a decidedly ironic eye. <laughs> there we go. I think of people as pink-coloured collections of sense data. But as early as his high school years, he was asking some fundamental questions. Questions he tackled, never taking himself seriously. I did believe it possible for a spirit at death to go to a universe entirely separate from our own. But I now consider that matter and spirit are so connected that this would be a contradiction in terms. What is mind? What is the relationship between mind and matter? Are they different things that can be separated and uh, be in different places? Or are they in fact the same thing? Are the mind and the body one and the same thing? Um, is the mind simply a machine? These are questions that fascinated Turing for the whole of his life. In 1930... So I bet he ruffled feathers with both, you know, the science community, the religious community, Pretty much any community, like he just looked yeah. at the world completely different than yeah. everybody else. He had like the Matrix glasses on. Yeah, it was like different. Yeah. Just like he saw it, everything a little bit different. Mm-hmm. And Which, he's considering uh, all the pills, not the red, not just red, yeah. just red pill, not just the blue pill, not just the yeah. black pill, all the pills, all the pills. Yep, man. Yeah, yeah, and I, like that that whole idea that just was just presented, like uh, our humans are just a thing of information and numbers that just goes around like i mean he's not I, wrong right so our minds are computers right yeah so, yeah i mean and and it's it's just funny to see like he's already ahead of his time i mean my god everyone now with their phones has become a profile like they're just yeah walking yeah. data hubs yeah your brain is basically a, yeah. a can be coded by meta, alphabet, and bike dance. Yep. yep. Pretty much. Pretty much, man. Countered an abstract problem that would radically change the course of his life. He was attending some lectures in St. John's College. The lectures were on a problem that had recently been posed by David Hilbert. Hilbert was a, a famous German mathematician. He was really the Pope of mathematics at that time. And he'd recently posed a very fundamental, very profound problem in the foundations of mathematics, which was called the decision problem. David Hilbert's idea was that every mathematical problem has a solution. And the holy grail of mathematics was to discover a strictly defined method a recipe that allowed you to recognize every time a true proposition from a false proposition. Turing worked in a way that would not at all be recommended to young scientists, neither in his time nor today. He delved into the problem. Without reading the literature by existing logicians, he attacked the problem directly by imagining and inventing his own method. He reflected while training at a sport soon to become an obsession, running. Does there exist a recipe such as the one sought by Hilbert? An infallible method would be required that could simply be applied without initiative or intelligence. In fact, a machine should be able to do it. So Turing invented an imaginary machine composed of an infinite paper tape and a pointer that could write and array symbols. 
It was an idea more than a physical machine, one that could take on many shapes. Students at the ENS in Lyon made one. Out of Lego. Nice. Turing had the idea to create a machine because, contrary to most mathematicians, his frame of mind led him to represent abstract problems in the form of logical mechanisms, which could be clocks, calculating machines, thought experiments. No one could have imagined that this thought experiment, hidden within an article on theoretical mathematics, would be the basis of that which would be called computer science 30 years later. Wow. Goodness gracious. In 1936, though, it was not Turing's discovery that made the headlines. The Spanish Civil War, Anschluss. History accelerated, war was imminent and inevitable. And thanks to the radio, Hitler's rants were heard all over Europe. Since the First World War, the radio waves had also become a new battlefield. Troop movements, land, aerial or naval offensives. Radio waves transported orders and countermands, secret information, the positions of all sides. Using radio at any time and in wartime exposes you to interception by an enemy. One way of trying to solve this problem is to use encryption, is to code up those messages. By well before the outbreak of war, the English coast was scattered with interception stations, where hundreds of female army auxiliaries permanently listened to the German army's frequencies and transcribed the messages intercepted in Morse code. Incomprehensible messages, since they were coded. As far okay, now I'm learning hmm. something here, what encryption really is, which is like scrambling something up and sending it somewhere else so nobody can tell what it is. It's what like with WhatsApp or Instagram or like all the messaging systems messenger claim to do, even though yeah. mm, that's BS. Yeah, you know it is. You know it is. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. But I mean that's crazy though. Like, yeah, yeah. I mean encryption, isn't it isn't it like unless you have the key, it's almost impossible. Like if something's encrypted, like if it's complicated, unless you have a key it's or or notice a pattern it's basically unbreakable yeah yeah like and you know, that's crazy oh, yeah i guess we're gonna learn how alan turing cracked it hell yeah far as codes are concerned the germans had developed what they considered the ultimate weapon they replaced the old methods with a machine a machine named enigma that could be configured in 1000 million 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 different ways Hmm. To break just one of its messages by brute force, one of today's computers would have to run for an entire year. Okay, Turing then. had never seen an Enigma machine, but he would soon know it down to the smallest detail. So we have here an Enigma machine, a rotor cipher device. The idea behind it is that when I push a letter on the keyboard, this letter is encoded by another letter. For example, when I press the key D, the K lamp lights up. Inside the machine, each rotor has internal wiring that transforms the letter entered into another. A D arrives in the first rotor, but an R comes out. The R then becomes a U, then finally a K, and it is the letter K that lights up on the box. It would of course be too simple a code if every time I pressed the letter D, the K lit up. So, as you can see, when I press the D again, now another letter lights up, the U. Each time a letter is entered into the keyboard, at least one of the rotors turns to the extent that the electric circuit changes and ends on another letter. To decode a message, you have to know the machine's initial configuration. 
The message receiver needed to know the rotor starting position chosen by the transmitter. When the rotors were configured in the same way, he could then type the encoded message on the keyboard and receive the decoded message on the lamp board. The advantage of this Enigma machine was that a message could be encrypted and decrypted with the same encoding settings. Wow. That was the idea. But as history has shown, it turned out to be the machine's weakness. Wow, I learned something of how wow. encryption works, with even with a, a machine of that time, and I guess with a machine of our time now. That's, that's crazy, though. Like, yeah. that's wild. Like, for, like, essentially a typewriter. A typewriter yeah. with, like, a mini computer. Like, a, it'd mm -hmm. be, like, a smart typewriter, basically. It, yeah, it, it was way out of its time. Yeah, like, you push a K, and then a U comes out. There's, a, but it goes through all these different letters, all these different options. And it's, like, you go to push it again, something else comes out. Like, that's crazy. Like, yeah, yeah. Who admitted that thing? That's wild, dude. Yeah. Man. In 1938, Turing was in the United States in Princeton, where he was carrying out fundamental research on mathematical intuition. He traveled, discovered Washington, New York, and began to take an interest in cryptography the art of encoding and decoding. In it, he found a sort of hobby that gave him a rest from serious mathematics, inventing secret codes. One of them is pretty well impossible to decode without the key and very quick to encode. I expect I could sell them to HM government for quite a substantial sum, but I'm rather doubtful about the morality of such things. On September the 1st, 1939, the Nazi army smashed into Poland. September the 4th, 1939, the day after Great Britain entered the war, Alan Turing was summoned to Bletchley Park, where the British code-breaking service was headquartered. He discovered an atypical establishment where military discipline had to adapt to very peculiar recruits. So at the moment we're in the library of Bletchley Park Mansion and the mansion is um, very much the same as it would have been when Turing arrived here on the first full day of the war. The atmosphere here at the beginning must have been quite strange. One of the code breakers described it as um, rather prim and rather like the first day at an English public school. <laughs> About 30 people had been recruited. Archaeologists, linguists, chess champions. There were even crossword fans. And only two mathematicians, which would suggest the British authorities still saw codes as more of a literary than a mathematical problem. It's hard to imagine the sorts of people that were employed here and who thrived in the Bletchley Park environment even being employed in a secret organization in Germany. Here, of course, there were homosexuals, there were Jews, there were anarchists, there were free thinkers, and their talents combined in this um, unholy, ungoverned, brilliant um, crucible of code breaking that there was okay. here at Bletchley Park. So it's like it's like a, a suicide squad of think tanks, you know. That's a good way to put it. That's like, kind of I, what it is. Like, you know, it's funny because it's a military organization, but this whoever they got is far from military. Yeah, yeah they 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 knew what they needed to get done, and they knew yeah. the right people to call yeah. for it. Is those outliers? The, yeah. those that you know think outside the box. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow, man. I would have loved. I would have loved to have been like in that room. <sighs> like, I think the both of us are way too dumb to be in that room. But <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, you need you need someone that that 
that isn't mili like military you know yeah. like you need someone that 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 questions orders rather than follows orders because yeah. out of that mentality genius can be born kind of thing you exactly. know and, and that's what make you know what whatever makes a good soldier doesn't necessarily have to mean it makes a good encoder or decoder that's a different uh, mind or just a strategist in general ah strategist you know? too yeah 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 <laughs> but even in this small world of cryptologists turin did not go unnoticed He despised social norms that he intended to sift through rationality. If he wore a gas mask in the summer, it was not due to a chemical alert, but because he was fighting hay fever. Mm. Little by little, the organization at Bletchley Park was set up. Every day, operators in the interception stations transcribed hundreds of messages, unreadable messages that piled up on the cryptologist desks with little result. And yet the English cryptologists had two exact replicas of the Enigma machine. They'd been handed over by the Polish a few weeks before their country was invaded. But actually having the machines here was not that much help in breaking them because Enigma was designed um, to remain secure even if it was captured by the enemy. With a code, a code generating machine, there are kind of two separate tasks. If you don't already know how it works, then you need to work out um, how the machine is engineered, how many wheels has it got, how do they operate together. You need to break the machine, as they say. And then the second part of the task is to devise um, code breaking methods that will enable you to read the daily messages that are, are sent by the German machines. Mm. And that was the hard part. That was where the brilliance and the ingenuity was needed. Alan Turing would tackle the Enigma problem head on and explore the way it operated in the tiniest detail. Ah. But while the old code breakers used graph paper and a pencil sharpener, Turing was convinced that most of the reasoning produced by the human mind could be mechanized. What if you needed a machine to fight a machine? Jean Valentine was an operator on one of those strange machines during World War II. Fifty years later, she returned to Bletchley Park, where she works as a guide. This machine, invented by Alan Turing, is called a BOMB, B-O-M-B-E. -E. It does a fantastic job searching for the settings on the rotors of the Enigma machines. This is equivalent to 36 Enigmas. One, two, three, four, five, six, the same. Twelve in each of these banks, and three twelves are 36. These drums, they're called, rotate, connecting with the commutator on the back panel. There are four little brushes behind every letter. See, letters all the way round. And each of these little uh, brushes has got 19 filaments in it. And these are connecting with the commutators on the back panel. Wow. Oh my goodness. Starting in 1940, the English mass... Oh, I, I'm lost. Are I'm you already like, I'm already like, so she didn't throw the necklace off the boat? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> no, I'm just saying, like, that's wild. It's just, yeah. I, dude, I... Oh man, to create like you need 36 of those Enigma machines to essentially break or crack one Enigma machine or the yeah, whole system yeah. is what, what I'm getting at the whole system, but still, mm -hmm. uh, so many moving pieces, like, yeah, oh my god, yeah, just, just looking at the mathematical equations there, I'm like, yeah, uh, there's no way, I'm like, you, yeah. You're, 
yeah, this, this Alan Turing guy was like on a whole other level. It's different. Like, he, <laughs> like, yeah. he is the definition of dot your I's, cross your T's. That yeah. is a level of organization that I will never have. And no. I won't even be close to having. No, no, no way. I, I couldn't, I couldn't do that. That's just, it's just different. It's like, it's different, man. It's just, yeah. you know, and I don't mean that in any kind of like derogatory way. It's just, it's just, it, it is not the world I live in. He saw right. the world completely different. Him and I completely different experiences. You know what I mean? We're looking at the same thing. He could pull away a, billion different kind of things and i'm like mm -hmm. but you know it was a leaf falling on the ground and he like writes a book about it you know what i mean yeah different. yeah he just sees it different yeah so which is why i like being in rooms with those kind of people and just i, I find someone like that at a party i am stuck right there and i am not moving because i might learn something that could help me one of these days oh that see for me it's different i i i'm afraid i'll dumb them down <laughs> like I'm so simple that just me being in close proximity, I want to make them dumb more. More dumb, <laughs> more dumb, dumb more. Exactly, guys. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Which is why uh that's why they most of the times they don't have social media. They they don't want to dumb down their brains a bit. They gotta protect their asset. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. Produced bombs. They enable systematic exploration of the Enigma machine's millions of possible configurations. When it stops, as it will from time to time, there will be letters pointed out on these indicator drums. And these are the possible settings. We telephone this information through just to an extension number and when I was here, I didn't know where we were ringing. When I came here to train as a guide 15 years ago, I discovered that these bits of information were going across the path a good, what, 10 meters. <laughs> Though I didn't know where it was going, and I'm sure they didn't know where it was coming from. Because here, secrecy was the order of the day. You didn't talk about what you were doing beyond the walls of the hut that you worked in. You told nobody what your job was, not even your closest relations, husbands or boyfriends or fathers, mothers, anything. You didn't. You were told not to speak, so we didn't. All right. The bombs were one of the best kept secrets of World War II. Thanks to them, not just one message was decrypted from time to time. Tens of thousands of them were. Wow. The English now had bulk access to a mass of information. Orders to attack or retreat, combat reports, troop morale and material status, weather reports, naval or aerial reconnaissance results, damage reports, requests for reinforcement. Everything or close to it went through Enigma and arrived decrypted and translated on the desks of the Allied command. But in addition to the role played in the war proceedings, it was the first time a machine set foot in a field hitherto the domain of human intelligence. Breaking codes is an activity that requires great intelligence when human beings do it. And here was a machine that was doing the work um, that human code breakers did. It was a machine that was um, performing tasks that require intelligence when human beings do them. If it is accepted that real brains, as found in animals, and in particular in men, are a sort of machine, it will follow that our digital computer, suitably programmed, will behave like a brain. But in the late summer of 1940, piercing the mysteries of thought was not a priority even for Turing. Ever since the French surrendered, Great Britain stood alone against Germany. In September came the Blitz. The Luftwaffe pounded England. London, Coventry, 
Plymouth, Birmingham, Liverpool. The major urban centres were systematically targeted and the civilian losses were considerable. Mm. Thanks to the first bombs, the enigma used by the Luftwaffe was decrypted and the Royal Air Force retaliated with ever-increasing efficiency. But the battle suddenly changed course. Since Hitler could not invade Great Britain, he decided to starve it. Oh. In June of 1940, Karl Dönitz, commander-in-chief of the Kriegsmarine submarine fleet, visited Lorient and decided to install there a gigantic submarine base as well as his command center. His mission was to cut the shipping routes that Great Britain was entirely dependent on for its oil, metal, wood and food. It was from this charming seaside villa beneath which a network of bunkers was dug that Donitz would lead the decisive battle of the Atlantic. L'augmentation progressive. Ça commence très doucement. L'augmentation progressive. The increasing number of submarines available at the front, what the Germans called the frontline U-boats, will enable Donitz to implement a tactic that he conceived back in 35 when he began development of the submarine division, that is to say, the Wolfpack tactic. Dönitz used a map of the North Atlantic divided into numbered squares. Each submarine established radio contact at least once a day to report its position and receive further instructions. Dönitz could thus deploy the U-boats like pieces on a chessboard. As soon as one of them spotted a convoy, it reported its position to the command center, which then gathered all the U-boats available for a grouped attack. On the evening of October the 17th, 1940, a convoy of 35 ships loaded with metal and wood was spotted by the submarine U-48. Dönitz sent five submarines to simultaneously attack it. In a single night, they sank 20 ships. Wow. Oh my God. It was the Wolfpack tactic, first major victory. Before, submarines attacked in isolation, so they could sink at most two to three ships, at the very best. Five submarines, though, 20 ships. By the end of 1940, hundreds of ships had already been sunk, and more than five million tons lost to the bottom of the ocean. This short propaganda film shows the efforts of the military authorities to warn soldiers of the deadly consequences of talking about classified information, especially when they fall upon the wrong ears. But propaganda was not enough. The U-boat seemed well on the way to winning the Battle of the Atlantic. However, the Wolfpack tactic had a flaw. It made extensive use of the radio. Cracking the code used by the U-boats would potentially allow the Allies to reverse the balance of power. The problem is that there wasn't one enigma, but many enigmas. The Germans used separate networks for their communications. One for the Western Luftwaffe, another for the infantry on the Russian front, and yet another for submarines in the Atlantic. Each network had its own keys, its own procedures, and sometimes its own variants of the Enigma machine. The one used in U-boats, known as Dolphin at Bletchley Park, was particularly difficult to decipher. 
Wenn sie 2, 3000 Kilometer auf When you are 3000 kilometers out in the middle of the Atlantic, you don't have the capability of using a communication cable. The Navy was therefore dependent on the development of radio communication. This is a very important point. That's why the Navy always tried to achieve the highest standards of security from Enigma. Everyone at Bletchley Park seemed to think that the naval Enigma was invulnerable. Alistair Denniston, the commander-in-chief at Bletchley Park, even made this surprising statement. You know the Germans don't mean you to read their stuff, and I don't suppose you ever will. But it was obvious to Turing how important it was to break naval enigma. Mm -hmm. um, and also it was a problem that, that had a, um, a peculiar appeal to him because he was a lone worker. And since no one else was touching naval enigma, he thought, this is the problem for me, I can have it to myself. <laughs> Around the manor, they began to build barracks. Huts, in Bletchley Park jargon. Turing moved into Hut 8, dedicated to the naval enigma. He would spend days and nights there on his own, poring over the stacks of incomprehensible messages. This is the original Hut 8. This is Turing's office that we're sitting in at the moment. Turing was head of Hut 8 and this is where the Battle of the Atlantic was won. Wow. wow. Hidden in these strings of characters, almost within reach, he knew there was vital information that could save lives, maybe change the course of the war. Days went by, blending into one another. All attempts systematically failed. And then finally, a night came along like no other. Turing had several ideas on this particular evening that cracked open the door a bit on the naval enigma. The date of that night went unrecorded, but it's one of the most significant nights in the history of the Second World War. Um, it was a real double whammy from Turing. He, he broke into the, the new additional feature of the Naval Enigma messages that had made them so difficult to break. And um, that same night, he invented a method called Banbarismus, which was used in breaking into the daily Enigma traffic. Huh. If we superimpose two character strings at random, the probability of getting two identical letters is for each letter one in 26. In contrast, in a German text, some letters are more common than others, so the probability is significantly greater, one in 17. Oh. It is on this basis that Turin invented a mathematical method to synchronize two encrypted texts, thus multiplying the possibilities for decryption. <laughs> the naval enigma no longer seemed out of reach, yet just a little nudge from fate was still needed. In the spring of 1941, a series of German ships were captured, allowing Turing and his team to complement their knowledge. Mm. Wow. In one incident in June, a damaged German submarine was forced to surface. The commander gave the order to abandon ship. He and all the crew jumped overboard, but the submarine, against all odds, did not sink. <laughs> the English immediately deployed a vessel and crew who managed to board and seize a complete enigma with documents including codes for several months. Hello. Submarines in operation left port with three months of codes, so there were still codes for several weeks. Thanks to this new intelligence, and with the help of the bombs, Hut 8 would succeed in deciphering the naval enigma on a daily basis, so well that the Admiralty would know the day-to-day -day positions of all U-boats present in the North Atlantic. That's crazy. This information allowed the Allied convoys to slip between the concentrations of submarines. During the 23 days... Man, I think they got lucky getting those, those German uh, submarines there and had all the information they needed. Like, that's just, uh, you know, there's some things that, that are 
I, I, I don't know. I don't want to say like divine intervention, but like who would have thought that the submarine wouldn't have sank? Yeah. Like, you know, cause I'm, I'm sure if they thought that, okay, we're going to abandon ship and jump overboard. Yeah. Let's throw our code thing out there first and then we'll all jump. We'll all jump ship. But yeah, yeah, I, that's crazy. So many different things had to work and fall in order for them to to even do that. But the fact that he was on the cusp of doing that, he just needed that to complete yeah. the whole thing is wild. Yeah, yeah. Like they, the Germans probably didn't think that anybody could crack their code, but they didn't meet all Alan Turing. There. Nope, nope. And he was all alone up in Hut Eight and doing his thing, and then. Had a eureka moment, mm. you know, and here we are. Man, it's crazy. Following the first decryption, no German submarines would succeed in spotting an Allied convoy. The calculations made after the war showed that 30% of the convoys, thus 30% of the tonnage transported by convoys, escaped destruction thanks to this code breaking. While the Battle of the Atlantic wasn't tipped in the right direction by this fact alone, it was indeed a decisive factor in the battle. Progressively, Bletchley Park went from being a workshop to a full-blown industrial unit. Dozens of new buildings were hastily built to house an army of typists, archivists and translators. It was at this moment that the war came to a critical turning point. We interrupt this program to bring you a special news. The Japanese have attacked Pearl Harbor, Hawaii by air, President Roosevelt has just announced. In late 41, the entry of the U.S. into the war quickly presented a new problem of an eventual landing on European coasts. There were many possibilities along the French coast, but in any case, the forward base was the U.K., and the U.S. would then need to direct to the U.K. a very important influx of material and personnel, in addition to the existing flow of supplies that had begun from the start of the war. But as U.S. troops amassed on the English coast, the Bletchley Park codebreakers were faced with a new challenge. The intercept people in Britain uh, were very used to listening to the did it da of Morse code. They knew this was enigma. And then one day in 1940 or 1941, they heard what they called a strange new music coming through their headphones. It sounded completely different to Morse code. It was based on two tones and it made a kind of burbling sound, a high-speed burbling sound as it was transmitted. One must realize that the Enigma machine was an entirely conventional machine. We could have made an Enigma in 1900. At the beginning of World War II, the Germans undertook the building of more modern and much more sophisticated encryption machines, including the most well-known, built by the Standard Electric Lorenz Company, and which the English codenamed Tuni. Tuni, a nickname for Tuna. Unlike Dolphin and Shark, the codenames for the naval Enigma, Tuni wasn't based on Morse code, but on the digital code used by teletypewriters. Without ever having seen one, the cryptographers from the research department were able to discover the logical structure of the mysterious machine, and they would oh. soon be able to build a replica. No way! But like Enigma, possessing the machine wasn't enough to break the code, and by the fall of 1942, Turing was called to the rescue. In just a few weeks, he found a way to crack the Tuni messages, a discovery that would play a major role almost immediately on the Russian front. In the summer of 1943, after the German army's defeat at Stalingrad, Hitler tried to retake the initiative by moving troops and tanks towards the Russian city of Kursk. Much planning went into this attack. 
and the planning, the discussions between Hitler and his generals was all carried out on Tunney. Um, so Bletchley Park was reading what Hitler was saying to his generals, what the generals at the, at the, um, at the Russian front were saying back to Hitler. And so they managed to discover practically everything about the German plans for Kursk. Wow. Mm. Not too smart. This information, promptly transmitted to Moscow, enabled the Russians to triumph in the largest tank battle in history and start their victorious advance towards Berlin. Wow. But the volume of Tuny messages was constantly increasing, and Turing's method, which relied on the intuition of the cryptographers, was manual, thus too slow. Mm. Once again, it would require a machine. However, the bombs were now old technology. Something new was needed. And what Turing found this time was an engineer called Tommy Flowers. Flowers was a specialist in electronics, an emerging technology based on vacuum tubes or valves. Appliances at the time had just a few valves, at most a few dozen. But Flowers wanted to build a machine with 2,000 of them. There was a belief amongst engineers that valves were too unreliable to be used in large numbers. You could use a couple of dozen, but the idea of using a couple of thousand, um, people believed, was crazy. So they said thanks, but no thanks to Flowers. But Flowers was a determined man. He knew he was right. So he went back to his own laboratory in North London, and he quietly got on with building the all-electronic machine that he knew the code breakers needed. Flower's machine was so gigantic that he had it nicknamed Colossus. <laughs> nice name. Turing was thrilled with its performance. His dream of machine intelligence suddenly seemed much less of a dream. It is customary in a talk or article on this subject to offer a grain of comfort in the form of a statement that some particularly human characteristic could never be imitated by a machine. It might, for instance, be said that no machine could write good English or that it could not be influenced by sex appeal or smoke a pipe. I cannot offer such comfort, for I believe that no such bounds can be set. Beginning in February 1944, Wow, another time of him being way ahead of the curve on things like this. Now, <laughs> it's great. It, oh, so scary. <laughs> like, this stuff was happening back in World War II, and we're scared of, you know, things that, like, ChatGPT will do and other AI stuff will do. Like, this stuff was has been around for, like, ages now. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, it, it, if he was ahead then... Could you imagine where we are now that we don't know? Like, that's crazy. It's just, yeah. it's it's eons. It's just, it's so different. The world here right now is so different than when he grew, like he was firing on all cylinders. You know what yeah. I mean? I, I, I wonder, it'd be so interesting to bring him to now and show him what the hell his ideas turned out to be. Yeah, yeah. And he, he might be scared of it. He might, he probably would be like, be like, oh no, I did, I, I messed up. Like, yep. abort mission, abort mission. Yep. But hey, he could marry whoever he wanted. So that's yep. a plus. Yeah, right? Yeah. Colossus automatically decrypted the communications exchanged at the highest level of the German general staff. Infiltrated at the heart of their communications, the Allies were poised to launch the biggest hoax of World War II, the famous Operation Fortitude. Operation Fortitude was uh, conducted well before the D-Day landings of June 1944, and its aim was to persuade the Germans that the landing was going to take place not in Normandy where it did, but much further east in the Pas de Calais area. What it did was to give the Germans the idea that that was where we were going. Now, we were able to monitor that and to tune it, to fine-tune it successfully in fortitude 
because we were able to intercept their strategic high-level communications, which made it clear that the deception was working, and working very well. What followed is well known, having been narrated, filmed, photographed up and down, and reenacted dozens of times in the cinema. On the dawn of June the 6th, Alan Turing heard the news at the same time as everyone else. The landing operations had begun. Hitler didn't respond fully to the Normandy invasion. He held his forces in reserve, waiting for the Calais invasion. So the Allied commanders knew that they had some breathing space at Normandy before wow. the full German forces were flung at them. And if they'd been there at the Normandy beaches to start off with, the story might have gone quite differently. For Harry Hinsley, a veteran of Bletchley Park who became a historian specialised in codes, the decryption operations helped considerably to shorten World War II. Several times he went into print as saying that he thought uh, ultra shortened the war by two years. I think we have to see this as being a symbolic calculation. One just has to see them as being very important helping things. Harry Hinsley also went on to say that one of the consequences, had the war not ended in May 1945, would probably have been that the first atomic weapon would not have been dropped on Japan, but on Berlin. Whoa. There would be no... Man, to think... Like, at the war not been shortened, and the atomic bomb put, b dropped on Berlin. Like, we see, we still, to this day, see the effects of both of those bombs being yeah. dropped on Japan, in Japanese society. Just imagine had that b been the, sa the deal with mainland Europe. Like, Dude, I, that would be, I mean, either way it's catastrophic, but so different. So, so different. It would yeah. have been a completely different, like, fallout story than Japan had, I would say. Yeah. But, man. Ooh. I mean, both would Ooh. have been a bad situation. Oh, yeah. But, like, oh, just to think of how mm. mainland Europe would look today had, you know, mm. this not happened. I, I Actually, I don't, I, I don't think I can even imagine what repercussions long term would happen with with a uh, uh, nuke dropped in in germany that would have been right. the wrong call but wow. yeah like there are people on here have explained like the repercussions that are being shown to this day in japan like there's certain there's radiation in people's dna's and their blood and water drinking supply so yeah i'm glad glad that the war was shortened up at least for the sake of europe yeah for sure yeah atomic bomb dropped on Berlin. On May the 8th, 1945, cheering crowds throughout Europe celebrated the Allied victory over Nazi Germany. Turing no doubt deserved to be celebrated at the side of the royal family and be treated as a national hero. Instead, he would disappear completely from official history. Mm. That's a shame. The victory was celebrated at Bletchley Park as well, but neither Turing nor Tommy Flowers nor anyone else could lay claim to the great progress that had been made there. Military secrecy was still the order of the day. On the still smoking ruins covering Europe, the Cold War had already begun. As the German forces retreated at the end of the war, they left tiny machines behind them all over Europe. The Russians, as they advanced, were capturing tiny machines, and the Russians reconditioned these machines, changed them in various ways, and used them to encode their own messages. So Tunney um, transitioned the defeat of Germany. Um, the language changed, but the tiny machines just carried on. Turing knew too much on subjects that were too sensitive. Ugh. His individuality and his homosexuality set him apart and worried the authorities. He wouldn't be treated as a hero, rather as a potential threat to national security. Oh. On this day in May 45, Alan Turing had less than 10 years to live. 
In 1945, he drew up the plans of what could have been the first modern computer. If only his employers at the National Physics Laboratory had considered the matter a priority. In 1948, he anticipated by several decades the development of artificial intelligence and artificial neural networks, work that his director would qualify as a schoolboy's essay. What? Around 1950, he wrote some of the first computer programs, among them the first chess program, a complete waste of time, according to some well-intentioned colleagues. Ugh. Through constant practice, Turing was by now a high-level marathon runner, just narrowly missing selection for the first post-war Olympic Games. Wow. In this house near Manchester, Turing would spend his last years. It was here that he one day invited a young man with whom he would have an affair. An affair that would end in court. Oh, no. In March 1952, Alan Matteson Turing was convicted of gross indecency. He avoided prison only by accepting chemical castration, oh. a treatment using female hormones to reduce the libido. His sense of humor remained intact, though, as evidenced by this account to a friend of his misadventures. Half the police of North England were out searching for a supposed boyfriend of mine. It was all a mare's nest. Perfect virtue and chastity had governed all our proceedings, but the poor sweeties never knew this. Being on probation, my shining virtue was terrific, and had to be. If I had so much as parked my bicycle on the wrong side of the road, there might have been 12 years for me. But a sense of humor and irony have their limits. Hormone therapy changed his body. He gained weight, grew breasts. His state of mind was affected by this. Ugh. From the beginning of his legal troubles, he had sensed that he would not walk away unscathed from this one. I'm not at present in a state in which I'm able to concentrate well. No doubt I shall emerge from it all a different man, but Quite who, I've not found out. On June the 8th, 1954, he was found dead in the bedroom of his Manchester home. His body contained cyanide, and a half-eaten apple sat on his nightstand. A verdict of suicide was returned. This was the starting point of a legend. Turing's apple has joined those of Newton and Snow White in the Apple Hall of Fame. A persistent legend has it that the Apple logo is a cryptid homage to the inventor of the computer. Do you see everywhere oh. it written that Turing committed suicide by biting into an apple that was laced with cyanide? This is a myth of our time. There is no real evidence for that. He might have committed suicide, or he might not. I think we'll never know. In 2013, the Queen officially granted Alan Turing a royal pardon. No one knows what the recipient would have thought of this very late rehabilitation. His body was cremated on the 12th of June, 1954. As for his spirit, so far, there's been no news. <laughs> and the link between thought and matter remains pretty much a mystery. Mm. Yep. Yeah, hundred percent. Gordon Brown was right. Yeah. They did him dirty. And I tell, I've said this before, man. When you're in that crowd of know-how and and get stuff done, it's a very slippery slope. When you yeah. know things, either people need to know or want to know, want to find out from you, or they need you to keep a big secret. You can wake up dead very, very quickly in that in those kind of circles. Oh, hundred percent. It wasn't an immediate death. For Alan Turing, but it was like over time. They just made him suffer a lot longer by taking hormones. This guy shortened the war. He had ideas for the first computers, AI way beforehand, and it all got turned down because of the times and 
who he loved and you know his solitude I, like i think it's i think it's more what he knew if you think about yeah. it I mean, I that's think it's probably the what? scapegoat that was used to oh, yeah. do all of that. It definitely. They're like, hmm, well, if we go after him for this, because we know we can get him for this with some bullshit, we can unalive him. Because that's mm -hmm. more simple yeah. Than, yeah. than having a loose thread out there. Right, right. Not straight up saying, you know too much, you have to die. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just do it, do it the other way. <laughs> it's it just, I don't know, man. I'm just telling you, Spencer, if you're ever, if we're both ever in that situation to know too much, I'll let you know. Like, hey, bro, close your eyes, close your ears, get out of this. You know, we got to get out of this situation. Just yep. never understand the full project, ever, mm -hmm. ever. Exactly. There used to be three of us, remember? <laughs> yeah. No, I don't. I don't. I don't. What are you talking about? <laughs> exactly. I'll exactly. cut that part out. Timeline, great documentary. <sighs> Automatic two thumbs up to y'all for this. Man. This was great. We love Jeez. doing these learned docs. I, I really it's, do. It's like a, a breath of fresh air. You know, Monday through Friday is those dumb TV shows that, I mean, they're, they're funny. They're for comedy. Yeah. They're escapism. Yeah. But learning stuff and keeping your brain nice and fresh is yeah. a good thing. Yeah. There's so much more history to learn that isn't taught for whatever yeah. reason. Um, and we could that's a whole different soapbox. But everyone knows that not everything can be taught at one in one sitting. It's good to have these moments of like, hey, man, open your ears. Let's see what else is out there to learn. Every one of these documentaries makes us a little bit smarter, at least makes us a little bit less likely to put our foot in our mouth, which is very, very good. Yeah, 100 percent, man. You ain't kidding. Thanks for watching. So around you can subscribe a place where you could watch another video. Wash your hands, scrub your toes, wipe your ass, blow your nose, and brace the suck. Unplug and do something epic, guys. See y'all in the next one. Later. Fellas, we could be that mistake. Let's do this.